Amen. The book of Nahum, the uh, prophet who is a sequel to the book of Jonah. Nahum is a sequel to the book of Jonah. The time period in which uh, Nahum prophesied and, and wrote this small book, scholars believe it's between 630 and 612 B.C., somewhere in that period of time, 630 to 612 B.C. And whenever it was, it was about 150 years after Jonah preached to Nineveh. You remember the book of Jonah, probably one of the most well-known prophets uh, of the Old Testament. Very simple book of, of, of Jonah, in which uh, God tells Jonah to preach to the Ninevites. Jonah says no, in essence, and tries to get away from the presence of the Lord, and, and then is swallowed by the great fish, and has a change of heart, and then goes to preach for them, uh, telling them that their city is going to be overthrown if they don't repent. Very simple message to the Ninevites, which was the uh, capital of the Assyrian Empire. And much to Jonah's chagrin, they repent. He didn't want them to repent. He was just going there doing what God told them to do. But he says, I knew you would forgive them if they repented, because you're merciful and gracious and slow to anger. I knew you would forgive them. And that's what you find. You find the greatest pronouncement of the grace and mercy of God in Jonah from a rebellious prophet who did not want them to be the recipients. And when you study Assyrian history, they were very cruel, very violent, very immoral, very wicked. And so they were the evil empire. I watched a documentary the other day about Ronald Reagan. They referred to the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Well, Assyria was an evil empire. Uh, the wickedness of the people is well documented in, in, in history. And so they had been a thorn in, in, in Judah's side for a long time. You read about Hezekiah and uh, the problems that he had with Sennacherib and uh, the Assyrian uh, Empire. Uh, but in the days of Jonah, they repented. That wicked, ungodly city that you wouldn't even think would, did. They repented. And Jonah said, just take my life, I don't even want to live. And it's interesting that the uh, book of Jonah ends with a question, and the book of Nahum ends with a question. Nahum is a sequel to the book of Jonah. 150 years after Jonah preached to the Ninevites, Nahum is now preaching to the Ninevites and saying, okay, time's up. God's judgment is coming. God's wrath is coming upon you for your wickedness. You have Obadiah speaking to those who are outside of Israel. You have Jonah speaking to those outside of Israel. You have Nahum here speaking to those outside of Israel. Those outside of Israel, the Gentiles, were accountable to God. They were under law. They were not under the law of Moses, but they were under law. And when they sinned, it was a violation of God's law. When they, when they engaged in idolatry, they were sinning against God. And so it took 150 years for them to go back into wickedness to the point where God says, okay, it's time for your judgment to, to come. And so we see here um, their wickedness being pronounced. Chapter 1 talks about God's wrath upon His enemies. Uh, Chapter, chapters 2 through chapters 3 is talking about uh, the destruction of Nineveh. And so there are some positive things in this book, as we will see, but the, the, whole, the whole tenor of the book is your, your day of judgment is coming, your punishment is coming because of your wickedness, and, and, and here, here it is. You know, and as I was reading this and studying the prophets, and you study Jeremiah, and I was looking at Lamentations and all that, I see why people in our feel-good society 
don't like studying the Bible. You know why our liberal brethren don't like studying the Bible closely? Because a lot of it's negative. And they want to be nothing but 100% positive. But you can't have the positive without the negative. Jesus preached more about hell than he did heaven. Some people don't realize that. So there is this, this negativity that's there, and it's because of people's sin. So we need to learn from it. Romans 15 and verse 4. Things written before time, talking about the Old Testament, was written for our learning. So let's learn some wonderful things from the book of Nahum. His name means comfort or consolation or uh, relief. Uh, nothing more is known about him as a man. We don't know anything about this man, Nahum, um, other than what we find there, um, that he is an Elkishite. And so some of these men that were men of God, sometimes we don't even have their names listed. It'll just say a man of God went and preached to so-and-so. Sometimes we have more details of their life given. And so when you see uh, the Assyrian uh, Empire depicted here as a very wicked people, keep in mind they came from a place where God had mercy on them 150 years earlier. He had mercy on them, spared them through the preaching of Jonah, but they went back into sin. Look at chapter 1, Nahum chapter 1, verse 1, the burden against Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. So we see here the word, the prophecy here is called, uh, sometimes it's called an oracle or prophecy, it's called a burden. The prophet, the word prophet in Hebrew means to boil or bubble forth. So the Spirit of God would directly give them a message and they would bubble forth that message in the sense of preaching uh, God's will. And we have God's wrath on His enemies depicted in verses... Um, uh, 2 through 15 of chapter 1. Chapter 2, God is jealous and Yahweh avenges. Yahweh avenges and is furious. Yahweh will take vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the guilty or clear the guilty. Yahweh, verse 3, uh, has His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds, all the dust of His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before Him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at His presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Verse 6, Who can stand before His indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Now let's stop right there and go back. Look at verse 2. It says, God is jealous, and the Lord, or Yahweh, avenges. The reason why he starts out with jealousy here of God is because the problem with the Ninevites and the Gentile world in, ge in general was idolatry. What did God say in Exodus chapter 20? I am a jealous God. You have no other gods before me. And in our society, people don't like to think of God as a jealous God. In fact, this concept here turned off Oprah. She was sitting uh, in a Baptist church hearing passages like this about God being a jealous God, and she didn't like that. She didn't like the concept of God being a jealous God. So she kind of went off on her tangent, and she's off on her tangent now. And look how much God has blessed her. And people look at her and say, look at the billions of dollars she has. She's not right with God. She's teaching a false religion by the things she's promoting. Because she didn't like these passages that say that God is a jealous God. Why would God say that He is a jealous God? What does He want from us? To worship Him. Our devotion. 
He wants our undivided attention. Number one, we cannot have a God beside Him. We cannot have a God before Him. We cannot have any God at all. He says in Exodus chapter 20, you don't put a God before me. You don't put a God beside me. He's jealous. I mean, you know, you go to your wife and say, I'm going to marry another woman. Does she not get jealous of that? If she, is that something that would not bother her? Well, I'm not going to put her before you. I'm going to put her beside you, honey. Happy Valentine's Day. You're not, she's not going to come before you. She's going to be beside you. She's going to be wife number two. Well, that'll go over like a lead balloon. That's something that should not happen. Because she would be right to be jealous. Because of the singularity of the relationship. Undivided attention as your spouse. And God is jealous. God created the world. He created Israel. He created the Gentiles. All the nations. And so they owe Him their undivided allegiance. And so it starts off by talking about the uh, jealousy of God here. Uh, Exodus 20 and verse 5 talks about uh, God's uh, jealousy. And, um, and, and Joshua 24 and verse 19 talks about how they're to give up these, these, uh, these uh, false gods and only serve God. As Joshua 24, 15 says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You need to make a decision, Joshua says. But as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. And because of God's jealousy, He pours out His wrath on those who, who turn their back and go to uh, idolatry and, and worship that which is not Him. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. This is basically what we talked about in our sermon that people don't like to think about. But this is the same God of John 3.16 that so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Same exact God. And so we need to walk in the fear of the Lord, realizing that He is a jealous God and that He will do this. We don't want to become an enemy of God. If we become the friends of the world, the New Testament says we become an enemy of God. We don't want to be on the receiving end of that. He reserves His wrath for His enemies. Verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and He will not acquit the wicked or clear the wicked. Now notice, He's not a God that lashes out uncontrollably. He doesn't lash out uncontrollably. He's slow to anger and great in power. 150 years earlier through Jonah, he gave them an opportunity to repent. And they did. And he spared the city. But 150 years after that, they got to a point where he says, Okay, Nineveh, it's time for your, time for your punishment. He is slow to anger and great in power. Look at Exodus chapter 34. <clears throat> Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the, God, the, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving the iniquity of transgressions and sins, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so we see here that God is slow to anger. So what happens is there is an accumulative effect of sin and wickedness in a society and it gets to a point where God says, okay, this is it. This is it. And so then God says that society now has to come uh, to an end. And some say, well, isn't there examples uh, of God lashing out in a, in, a, in a way that didn't seem like it gave them time to, to straighten up? You have Nadab and Abihu, you have Uzzah. But the problem is God had already instructed them. He instructed them, told them where to get the fire. 
Leviticus 10. And they disregarded that, offered up strange, unauthorized fire to God, then God consumed them. In the case of Uzzah touching the ark and being struck dead, they disregarded God's instruction on how the ark was to be carried. He didn't strike them down initially, but there was that time uh, period given for them to realize, hey, what we're doing is wrong, and it took that to get their attention. It took that to get David's attention. What about Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts? Did not Peter give them a chance to own up to their wrong? Did you sell the property for so much? Yes, for so much. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Then they were struck dead. They had their opportunity. They conspired together against God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. So God is slow to anger and great in power, and He will not acquit or clear the wicked. The wicked are going to be punished. People in our society and court systems, they get off on a technicality. Something wasn't done right. The forensics wasn't done right. The paper wasn't signed here. So you have a, uh, this person that's as guilty as guilty can be gets off. Goes free. Not with God. Not with God. He will not clear the wicked. Their day is coming. The Lord has His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust, the dust of His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake. Here's this language here that's apocalyptic language. It's, it's language denoting uh, uh, God's power in its descriptive language to help us get a better grasp of of what uh, God is trying to get across. The mountains quake before Him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at His presence. Yes, the world and all who are in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Very similar to what you find in Revelation chapter 6. Look at Revelation chapter 6. This language you find here in Nahum is found in the book of Revelation. In fact, a lot of the symbolic language in the book of Revelation is taken from the prophets. Look at verse 14, Revelation 6 and verse 14. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and isle was moved out of its place. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. It said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? No one who is an enemy. No one who is an enemy will be able to stand. So the question back in Nahum 1.6 is, Who can stand before His indignation? No one. Who can endure the fierceness of His anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by Him. But, notice the contrast. Look at verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He he knows those who trust in Him. Look at verse 7 there. Those who put their trust in Him, He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows those who are His. He knows those who trust in Him. So God is a jealous God. He's a wrathful God. But He's also a good God. Verse 7. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows those who trust in Him. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We find that concept in the Bible. In the New Testament rather. 2 Timothy chapter 2. God knows who His people are. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who trust in Him. He knows those who are His. 
So even though God is a God of wrath, we see the goodness and the severity of God here in Nahum chapter 1. He is also good. And if we go to God in a strong, as a stronghold in the day of trouble, we're putting our trust in Him that He will protect us. A stronghold, a tower, a, a castle, a place like uh, that would be a shelter type area is a place that you go to because you trust you're going to be protected from what's going to happen. There are uh, some houses that have storm shelters. You go in there because you trust you're going to be protected from whatever's going on, tornado, whatever. You're going to be trust, you trust that. Some, some houses above ground, they have a safe room. You go, again, you go in there, they're reinforced. It's a stronghold. It's an area that you go to. In the ancient world, they would have these strongholds that you could go to in the day of trouble, in the day of dif- difficulty, because you put in your trust that there's going to be safety there. But when you put your trust in the Lord that He is good, that He will be with His people, then you are going to benefit from His goodness. Look at verse 8. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. You become an enemy of God like the Ninevites had become, then you're going to face his wrath. Look at verse 9. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while uh, tangled like thorns and like drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So here he's talking about conspiring against God. What do you conspire against the Lord there? And the conspired is devise. What are you going to devise against the Lord? Well, whatever it is, He's going to make an utter end of it. Nothing is going to uh, defeat God. Nothing is going to come up against God and prevail. Verses 12 through 15. Thus says the Lord, Though they are safe and likewise many, yet in the, this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. This was talking about, uh, and it's going to culminate in the, uh, the, the good tidings, uh, the problem that Assyria was to God's people. Always a constant threat, Assyria was. But then they are going to be conquered, their, their problems that they're causing for everyone else is going to come upon them when the Babylonians rise to power. And then the Babylonians, of course, were going to be used by God to bring judgment upon Judah in around 606 uh, uh, B.C. Look at verse 14. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods I will cut off the carved image and the molten image, and I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Here's their problem, idolatry. Their problem was idolatry. The house of your gods, talking about the uh, idolatrous temples of the Assyrians, I'm going to cut off your carved images, your molding images, and I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Uh, Verse 14, the word vile there is something that's referred to as something that's contemptible. They had become vile. They had become contemptible uh, by their false worship. And God says, I'm going to dig your grave. So that denotes He's going to kill them as a nation and uh, bury them. And uh, again, you see in history, this is exactly what happened as far as the rise and fall of nations. Assyria, Babylon, and then the Medo-Persians the Grecian, also known as the Macedonian Empire, and then Rome, in which time Jesus was born. Look at verse 15. This is good news to God's people. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of Him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. 
O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. So this is good news for Judah, for them to continue to, to do the Lord's will and to keep the feast that God had appointed to them to do. And we see here, he says, this is the feet of him who brings good tidings. Paul quotes this verse in Romans chapter 10 and refers it to the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 10 in the New Testament. <clears throat> Romans 10. As he's talking about the need to send out preachers, he says in verse 14, How then shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent out? As it is written, Nahum 115, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So we see there uh, that this has a reference ultimately uh, to the gospel and the plan of salvation and the plan to take the gospel to the whole world. The defeat of the enemies is good news for God's people. And that's what you see ultimately in the cross. In the cross you see the defeat of the devil and his angels. All of his all of those who work for Him. The defeat of wickedness in the cross of Jesus Christ. That brings about good news of salvation. Good tidings. That's what the word gospel actually means. It talks about the, those on the mountains coming down and bringing this good tidings. Nahum 1 and verse 15. Who proclaim peace. So he's letting Judah know, look, Assyria is going to be dealt with. Assyria is going to be dealt with. They're no longer going to be a problem for you. And, of course, with, that is with the expectation of Judah remaining faithful to the Lord and doing His will. So he tells them to continue their appointed feast, perform the vows, and the wicked one shall no more pass through you. Talking about the problems Judah had with uh, Assyria, for he is utterly cut off. So... During that period of time, that should have been a time for Judah to straighten up their act. But in times of ease, times of things going well, people tend to get wicked again. And that's exactly what happened. And therefore, with the rise of the Babylonian Empire, God says, I'm going to use Babylon to bring judgment upon Judah. Yes, Second Kings nine. Second Kings nine. Second Kings uh, <clears throat> seven, nine and ten. <clears throat> Syria flees. Uh, verse nine. Uh, then they said to one another, "We are not doing right." This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning lights, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. And they went and called the gatekeepers of uh, the city and told them, saying, We went out to the Syrian camp, and, the sure, and surprisingly, no one was there, not a human sound, only the horse, horses and donkeys tied and the tents Intact. This is talking about when God caused them to, uh, to flee. And so there, there is uh, here God rescuing uh, the people from uh, the terrible plight of the Syrians. So here we see the, the good news again uh, in its uh, form here in the prophets of good tidings. The enemies are going to be defeated. This is good news for you. Of course, we know that in a spiritual sense in the New Testament. Anything else about chapter 1 before we go into chapter 2? Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. He who scatters has come up, up before your face. Man the fort. Watch the road. Stretch your flanks. Strengthen your 
flanks. Fortify your power mightily, for the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob, like the excellence of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. So it's talking about them to, to strengthen themselves. Now that the enemies of the Assyrians, the threat of the Assyrians is not going to be a, a problem anymore. Verse 3, the shields of his mighty men are made red, the valiant men are in scarlet, the, the chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished, the chariots, chariots rage in the streets, jolted one uh, another in the broad roads, they seem like torches, they run like lightning. So it talks about the swiftness of the army there. Verse 5, he remembers his nobles, they stumble in their walk, they make haste uh, to her walls, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the river are opened, and the palace is dissolved. What's very interesting about that is there was a problem during that time that's, that is recorded by historians. The flooding of rivers made breaches and breaks in the walls of Nineveh. The, the flooding of the rivers that were taking place, weakening the walls. And historians tell us that's exactly what happened and made it uh, an easy target for those who would get in. Your primary defense in the ancient world was your walls. And if they broke down, if they faltered, then you're going to be conquered. And history tells us that the, the, the great amount of flooding that took place uh, in Nineveh uh, uh, made breaches and uh, breaks in the walls that made them uh, vulnerable to attack. So this is exactly prophesying of what actually happened in history. And we have it recorded for us. And so we see here the defenses is prepared. The the, the, The gates of the rivers are open and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed she shall be led away captive she shall be brought up, and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves uh, beating their breast. So here we see the downfall of Nineveh. They would be absorbed into the Babylonian Empire. They would be conquered uh, by the Babylonians. And God used providence to do that as well. The swelling of those rivers, the, the breaking of those walls that uh, caused them to be dis- defenseless. Verse 8. Though Nineveh is of old, was like a pool of water. Now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty and desolate and waste. The heart melts and the knees uh, shake. Much pain is in every side and all the faces are drained of color. Again, uh, talking about uh, what's going to happen, the, the stealing of the goods that are in there, the silver, the gold taken out of the, the conquered uh, uh, place there in Nineveh. Verse 11, Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding uh, place of the young lions? Where the lion walked, the lioness and, her, and the lion's cub, and no one made them afraid. This could have reference to some of the the decorative art that you find in Nineveh that a lot of archaeologists have found that depicted lions, carved images that were there in Nineveh. And how that, uh, it says there, where the lion walked, a lioness and a lion's cub, and no one made them afraid. They They were statues, of course. And so uh, there was a lot of, a tremendous amount of artwork and decor in Nineveh. And yet all of that is for naught. Verse 12, the lion tore in pieces enough for her cubs, killed for uh, his lioness, filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. It's very interesting that, you know, in our modern times, lions are, are pretty much and in that area, isolated only on the continent of Africa. But 
the extent of their territory was up into Israel and up into uh, that part of the world in the ancient time. It's very much like uh, uh, how that uh, bison in our country roamed all over the United States. There were bison in Texas roaming free 100, 200, 300 years ago. But now they're just they're isolated in just certain areas. So uh, again, this shows exactly what happens as far as the, the imagery and the language of the Bible going along with history and what we know to be true. Now look at verse 13. And we'll end on verse 13. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. I am against you. And that is something you, you don't want. You don't want God uh, to be against you. Mark chapter 9 and uh, verse 40. Jesus said, He who is not against me is on our side. You're either for Christ or you're against Christ. And there is really no middle ground. You're either for me or against me. And so we see here that God is saying, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. When God becomes against a nation, that nation is doomed. That's why we need to pray for our nation. That's why we need to be salt and light in this nation. We do that by how we... uh, influence society by living every day the Christian life if we believe in voting how we vote who we promote we need to be very careful about uh, who is candidate for a particular power in uh, this state or in this nation to make sure that they're in line with biblical principles as much as they can be as much as we could have Uh, sometimes it becomes a choice between the lesser of the two evils and that becomes unfortunate. Um, But we need to help this nation uh, to get back on a right track. We'll continue our study of the book of Nahum. Only one more chapter in that book. And then we will go into the prophet Habakkuk that only has uh, three chapters as well.